A global battle of political systems is underway. Liberal democracy once seemed unstoppable. Across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. But now authoritarianism is on the rise. And even in places where people choose their leaders through the hard-won right to vote, many seem drawn toward candidates with dubious democratic credentials. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. In 2024, democracy will be tested like never before. Pretty much half of the population of the world is voting in one form of election or another this year. It's the biggest electoral exercise in history, with pivotal votes in major powers. Elections in India span about four weeks, roughly, because the country is so huge. We have 450 million people, Europeans, in 27 countries that every five years elect uh, members of the European Parliament. 2024 is going to be um, our 30th anniversary of obtaining uh, democracy in South Africa. This election has consequences for all of Latin America. If Donald Trump takes over again, it's very likely that he will destroy the United States as, as we know it. So will this be the year democracy gets a vote of confidence or eats itself alive? I'm DW correspondent Rosie Burchard. I'm going to take you from here in Brussels on a world tour of some of this year's most consequential elections to find out. I'll be speaking to DW experts on five continents to bring you up to speed on this bumper electoral year where the fate of democracy itself seems to hang in the balance. People head to the polls this year in dozens of countries. We'll be focusing on some of the biggest and most important in Asia, Africa, Europe and the Americas. Not all places where people can vote are necessarily democracies, where all the state's power is rooted in the people. In systems classed as most democratic, power is deliberately shared between different parts of the state. Those different parts have the capacity and the duty to check each other to make sure everyone keeps to the rules courts to protect all individuals' rights and make sure the state acts within the law, an opposition free to scrutinise and challenge government policies, journalists free to investigate and report without fear, and citizens free to protest, gather and voice dissent. This makes real democracy more than an electoral popularity contest. None of the democracies we'll look at fulfil all these conditions perfectly. But the more those institutions are eroded, the less power belongs to the people and the closer a state moves to autocracy. 2024's election bonanza kicked off in January in Taiwan, the self-ruled territory which China sees as its own. China wants to take control of Taiwan. It says that Taiwan is part of China. Its government is not legitimate. And that becomes essentially a kind of a battle of stamina, a battle of wills, like who can hold on the longest. I'm Richard Walker, I'm DW's chief international editor. I've been covering a lot of the big geopolitical questions that we're facing now. You know, the contest between uh, China and the United States, the place that India has in the role where Russia uh, fits in the mix. Taiwanese voters chose a president, William Lai, from the party seen as most anti-Chinese. But this time the party held on to power by a narrower margin. So a bit of a split result. On the one hand, continuity of a kind of robust line uh, towards China. On the other hand, a significant chunk, a majority of the electorate saying, it's time to try to get on better with the Chinese. So Richard, what did this election tell us about the health of Taiwanese democracy. It's a remarkable sign of the resilience of this system that it's kept going under all of that enormous Chinese pressure, but they still go about these elections in a clean and fair way. 
Um, so I think that is also, you know, one of the ways in which Taiwan is just a sort of a living rebuke to the Chinese system. The Chinese say, oh, you know, democracy is a Western invention. Well, this is very much not a Western place um, and democracy is absolutely alive and kicking here. But the story is not so simple elsewhere in Asia, which is home to the world's biggest democracy. I think this next election uh, will be extremely important for the future of India because we are hearing a lot about um, democratic norms being undermined. We are seeing um, minorities under threat. I'm uh, Amrita Chima and I was born and brought up in India. A few years ago, Deutsche Welle uh, asked me to set up the bureau in Delhi uh, and head this bureau and that's what I'm doing. For the last few years, I'm heading DW's bureau in Delhi. India's parliamentary elections are set to take place throughout April and May. It takes that long because it's a huge undertaking. And it's baffling from anyone from the outside to see how that works. They have to ensure that everybody has the ability to cast their ballot. And that means often, and they're you know, going to remote places, you know, they send ballot boxes on camels in remote areas of the desert. They use mules and donkeys and take them into the Himalayas and remote hamlets. So Indians actually also love voting. For the past decade, this man has led the country, Narendra Modi. And this year, he's expected to win an unprecedented third term. Everybody thinks that the party of the incumbent Prime Minister Narendra Modi will win. And that party is the Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP. And, and this is due to a combination of factors. Um, the opposition is hugely fragmented. There are more than 2,000 political parties in India. Yet Modi seems to have won the hearts and minds of millions. And I think one of the biggest things that uh, makes him very appealing is because India has a young population, he taps into this aspirational class of young Indians. There are lots of other areas where the BJP has delivered big time in terms of infrastructure. Even now, uh, because this is an election year, I mean, every day there's a new scheme in recent years, analysts have begun raising questions about what they call Modi's majoritarian style of governance. What they mean is pandering to the aspirations of the majority community. Now that is the Hindu community in India. The Hindus are an overwhelming majority in India. But when India got independence, the constitution they adopted was a secular constitution in which everybody is taken into account, not just the majority community, but the minorities were also protected. Many of the people from the minorities feel that they, are, they feel under threat. And particularly those who feel under threat uh, are India's largest minority, and that's the Muslims. Modi himself denies oppressing minorities. We are home to all faiths in the world, and we celebrate all of that. In India, diversity is a natural way of life. And though the country's democratic setup should, in theory, protect minority rights, there is obviously a lot of concern about the major institutions which underpin democracy, like the judi judiciary, right? Uh, like, like, like the election commission, like, uh, you know, um, uh, key bureaucratic positions. All of those, uh, they are a lot of accusations that uh, the BJP has put in people who are, um, you know, close to their way of thinking. Some in the media claim authorities are trying to intimidate the press. Every time there's some kind of, they don't like what somebody's written, the law enforcement agencies are sent in to conduct a tax raid. And that is also to silence critics among the media. But Modi's geopolitical star has been rising in the West, with leaders in Washington, Paris, Berlin, and many other places rolling out the red carpet for him. 
they seem largely unconcerned about allegations of democratic backsliding in India. They really see India as absolutely crucial counterweight to China. And so that I think Western governments are prepared to give India um, quite a bit of freedom. I think it would take a lot more for Western governments to really seriously raise very vocal concerns. Delhi has not only managed to deepen ties with liberal democracies, it's also kept up cosy relations with autocratic Russia through the BRICS alliance. That's become much more politically controversial since Moscow's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. But India isn't the only country trying to juggle friendships with democratic and non-democratic powers. Fellow BRICS member South Africa has been treading a similar path. They and others share a certain scepticism toward Western positioning. When countries like India or South Africa or other countries in the global south um, look at Western countries talking about democratic values, um, they see pretty much a bunch of hypocrites. Um, they see countries that have um, built their wealth on histories of colonialism, in the case of Europe, uh, or the repression uh, of, of uh, indigenous populations. This rings extremely hollow. Living in South Africa at the moment, it feels a little bit like we're on the precipice of something really big. My name is Diane Hawker and I am the South Africa correspondent for Deutsche Welle. Um, I cover news in South Africa and the Southern Africa region. So looking at countries like Lesotho, Botswana, um, Swaziland, Namibia, but for the most part, I'm focused on South Africa. South Africans will vote between May and August in an election that's expected to be the most competitive since the end of the racist apartheid system 30 years ago. We are going forward. I do actually still remember the, the 1994 election. I was about 10 years old. Uh, and the thing that I remember about it most clearly was that um, like my grandmother had never voted as a black South African. And she was already, you know, over 70 years old, and this was the first time that she was ever going to be able to actually um, use that right to really speak for herself in the country of her birth. Since then, the African National Congress, the ANC, has dominated South Africa's parliament. Polls suggest current President Cyril Ramaphosa's party will again get the most votes this year, but with a smaller than ever majority. A lot of, 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 of older voters do still have um, that connection to the ANC as a liberation movement, as a movement that for the first time offered um, you know, black citizens housing that was able to, to, to provide better education. But what I think that young voters will say is that there's more to be done and there are questions about whether the ANC is the party that can do that more. South Africa has one of the youngest populations in the G20, many of whom are frustrated by high unemployment, allegations of corruption and the regular load-shedding power cuts which disrupt daily life for many South Africans, including Diane. Election ...where we have independent candidates... Oh, sorry, load-shedding. <laughs> My light just changed. I didn't actually realize our power was going off at two o'clock. Voter turnout has been falling for decades, with some analysts blaming disillusionment with Pretoria's democratic dream. But now, a push to rejuvenate South African democracy is underway. For the first time, independent candidates will be able to stand in national elections, and several new parties will be on the ballot these new parties don't all have a link to the struggle movement. They're not legacy parties in any way. They are, a lot of them, led by younger people. Um, and that may bring more um, people to the voting stations. If we're not able to bring more people into the democratic process, that you will have an even larger group of people becoming disenfranchised and unhappy with the idea of democracy. It's been a shaky time for African politics, 
with a series of coups in recent years. If South Africa started to slip away from democracy, it would be a very poor sign to send to the rest of the region. Um, it would be something that people, you know, that have been watching us closely, they kind of see us as a beacon of hope. Thousands of kilometres away, change is already afoot in another regional heavyweight. Latin America has a very sad history of governments, especially leftist governments, that have come to power, that have shown that uh, they can do a different type of government for the people and then refuse to leave. We're about to see if Mexico is going on the same path. My name is Javier Arguedas. I work with DW's Latin America programs. I'm a news anchor at DW News in Spanish, and I have been correspondent for Latin America covering all the issues in the continent. Mexico will almost certainly be governed by one of these two women after this June's elections. In a first, both the incumbent Morena party and the more conservative opposition have put forward women presidential candidates. We'll see how this plays out, though, because um, despite the fact that it's a very good um, aspect of representation to have a woman in power, for sure, Latin America has unfortunately had uh, a story or a history of making it difficult for women in power because of the misogyny that unfortunately is still present in the continent. Polls suggest Claudia Scheinbaum from the ruling party will win. She's seen as the protege of Mexico's outgoing president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who swept to power in 2018 on a populist leftist ticket. Claudia Schimbaum is considered uh, just a continuation of Andres Manuel López Obrador's policies. Some of those have proved popular, like a drive to reduce poverty and promote a more inclusive political discourse. But the outgoing leader has also been accused of trying to weaken Mexico's democratic institutions. Two of the most uh, important and controversial measures that Andrés Manuel López Obrador uh, tried to put into place were a reform of the judiciary system um, and a reform of the uh, electoral watchdog. Now, critics of Andrés Manuel López Obrador say that those two measures were nothing short of um, trying to grab onto power and to ensure that uh, the executive controls all of the Mexican government. Claudia Scheinbaum defended cuts to the electoral watchdog to DW last year. Eh, in Mexico, la democracia eh, electoral is de las más caras del mundo. Y la pregunta es si eso es necesario o no en un país que requiere recursos para muchas cosas. But critics are also concerned about the power the current government has given to the military, which now manages parts of civilian infrastructure, including some train lines and airports. The argument of the government is it is necessary because the military is better organized, is less prone to corruption. But of course, uh, many see uh, an effort to have the military on his side in case things at some point don't go his way. Public protest and the courts have so far curbed the scale and scope of reforms, but Mexico has slipped in global democratic rankings. The institutions in Mexico have held up so far, but the problem is critics say this will probably be in danger if there is another term and if the current government gets strengthened in the next election, because then they will succeed in uh, changing the things that they actually could not change in this current term. And then we might see an authoritarian regime in Mexico. This could have other consequences. So if the Mexican democracy fails, it's going to be the drug dealers that are going to take control. But if institutions continue to stay strong and to actually perform and do what they have to do, um, I think uh, the Mexicans might have uh, a strong democracy. Even the most robust institutions can come under pressure when voters feel cheated by the system. That's a dilemma facing the world's biggest multilateral democratic system, the 27-member European Union. The key question in this election is how strong the far-right group is going to be in the European Parliament. Will they be able to block legislations? Will they be able to significantly uh, influence the work of the chamber? Will they make any consensus 
impossible. European Parliament elections will take place over three days in June, with hundreds of millions of people eligible to cast votes. The outcome will herald an even bigger changing of the guard here in Brussels, when, based on the results, EU member states assign the top jobs at the European Commission, the European Council and elsewhere. And it's all going to play out right here in Brussels at the European Parliament. Let's go in. So my name is Alexandra von Nam, I'm DW's Brussels Bureau Chief, but it's not my first stint abroad. I was based in Moscow many years ago. I also on behalf of DW covered uh, various crises and wars. The European Parliament is defined by pluralism, negotiations and consensus. No single political bloc has an absolute majority of the more than 700 members. The biggest powers will almost definitely remain the centre-right and centre-left. But the far-right Identity and Democracy Group is projected to make gains. It was formed in 2019 to unite populist right-wing Eurosceptic parties like Marine Le Pen's National Rally from France or the Liga from Italy. Accusations that the EU has failed to manage migration have fueled the rise of the far-right across Europe. And that's making mainstream parties more open to populist policies as they try to claw back votes from the fringes. And this means the far right could push their agenda further into European policy. There is uh, this growing dissatisfaction with uh, Brussels, with uh, actions of the national government. But of course, it's much easier for the far right to exploit our fears. They just um, go for the easy solutions. Uh, they say, OK, you know, we're going to build walls at the border, uh, at the external borders of the European Union. Nobody will be able to come. Uh, that's ridiculous. You, you cannot do it. Uh, and it's also against the law. But the populace may not get it all their way. These people are pro-Democrats rallying in Germany in January. Hundreds of thousands across the country demonstrated against a far-right party after reports its members met with neo-Nazis to plot mass expulsion of migrants. The demonstrations ignited a debate about if and when it's appropriate to exclude the extreme right entirely to protect democracy from potentially self-destructive choices. It's all a sign that their rise is far from inevitable. But one shift in Europe's political makeup is guaranteed. In July, it's Hungary's turn for the six month rotating presidency of the EU Council, and that grants power over the bloc's policy making agenda. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban is known to keep up friendly ties with Moscow. He has been slammed by some as Putin's agent, uh, and he has repeatedly blocked or delayed sanctions against uh, Russia. He has hampered the flow of financial aid to Ukraine. So there are concerns and worries uh, that having him at the helm of EU, EU's rotate, or the EU's rotating presidency will make it much more difficult for the whole of the EU to continue with its support. Uh, to Ukraine. And that could be a disadvantage in what might be a long war. Vladimir Putin is hoping that he can just keep fighting and keep grinding on in Ukraine for so long that the democratic systems of the West start to, start to um, waver in their support for Ukraine. Then, of course, the democracies of the West, particularly the Europeans and the United States, having to keep things together in pluralistic, multi-party systems. Um, and this is going to be really a, a very, very important test, I think, for the endurance, for the stamina of these political systems uh, up against each other. A test which could still get a whole lot harder. Would Trump be a much bigger problem than Viktor Orban? Yes. This election is really as crucial as it gets and it might change the order of the world we know since the end of uh, the World War II. I'm Ines Pohl, I'm the bureau chief here in Washington since three and a half years, but I've been here before. So this actually is really my third election I'm covering. 
Before coming here to Washington again, I was uh, the editor-in-chief for three years uh, uh, at Deutsche Welle. So I've been around. This November, American voters will decide on their future president in the last major vote of 2024. They're likely to face a choice between the same two old white men as last time. Former President Donald Trump is expected to run against incumbent Joe Biden in this race. It's bound to be tight, yet the results will have significant consequences for some of the globe's biggest institutions. If Donald Trump gets elected or if his MAGA people uh, will win the two chambers, um, it's very likely that the funding of uh, Ukraine to defend itself will be cut uh, dramatically. So the world has to be prepared that NATO will be dramatically weakened. Um, Donald Trump hates the UN. Uh, he ridicules the UN. Um, it's also very likely that he will be less, less supportive uh, of uh, the United Nations. Donald Trump will leave the Paris uh, Climate Accord right away as he did when he was in office last time. He's a He's a so-called climate denier. Trump says he doesn't understand. At home, Biden is framing the choice between him and Trump as a vote for or against American democracy. Democracy is on the ballot. Your freedom is on the ballot. Trump's past includes attacks on the judiciary. Man, he's a nasty judge. He's a Trump-hating guy. On the media. That's enough. Put down the mic. On the rule of law. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, OK? He rejected the results of the election he lost in 2020. This, this is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. <laughs> which led to this riot on January 6, 2021. And he's promised more should he win the White House again. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border and we're drilling, drilling, drilling. Polls suggest many Americans are disappointed by the choice they're likely to face again this year. It's a nation divided. We only have two parties. That's one reason why everything always is so polarized. Now on top with social media and how they work and how people get their information, they're kind of only listening to what they want to hear. They're only listening to news outlets, to their Facebook groups, which kind of reaffirm their, their opinion. That makes the divisiveness even stronger. Social media may have democratized information and opinion by allowing everyone a potentially global platform, but it has massively complicated elections in all democracies, creating a web of opinion sharing with no framework of rules or even agreed facts. It offers huge potential for disinformation and for foreign interference to sway large populations. When you have the combination of an open society with such a wide open system uh, of communication that can reach pretty much everybody and everybody can reach everybody else, I think th the impact of this on democracy is still not understood. It's another threat to democracy that's coming from within the system. In this case, from within the palms of our hands. And when US voters decide on their country's future this November, people in the rest of the world can only watch and wait and scroll on from afar. The United States is certainly not a blemish-free democracy, far from it. Um, but still, it is the country in the world that stands, stands for democracy more than any other. And if there is, you know, under a potential second term of Donald Trump, you know, a, a, a backsliding on the scale that, that some uh, have been warning about, then that would be a really devastating um, signal to the world that um, democracy um, is brittle. This is, I think, the huge worry that people have about the United States at the moment, um, that US democracy is kind of turning in on itself and devouring itself. There's no doubt about it. The sense of inevitability and progress that once underpinned all talk of democratization is gone. 
in 2024, democracy stands on shaky ground. But after speaking to colleagues around the world, I'm struck by the faith they still have in, in the people, in the voters they're speaking to every day. As a South African, I, 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 I am still optimistic. I do think that our democratic institutions go beyond just political parties. It is not easy to mess with the Mexican democracy because Mexicans have shown that they will be there to defend it. I certainly hope it is just a phase and that things will turn around. And as for the future of India, I'm cautiously optimistic. But that doesn't mean there's no cause for concern as this big inflection point in history looms. I believe that this country still has a lot of power and energy to reinvent itself. Again, it overcame so many crises in the last. But the system has to work. If the system is broken, then the best people will have a hard time to bring it back to what it was. But of course, we're the lucky ones who get to play our part in democracy. We report freely from places where people, to varying extents, get a say over how their lives are governed. Defending those democratic systems seems obvious, if not easy, when the threat comes from across a border. We're seeing that fight going on in Ukraine right now. When there's an external threat, a country can rally round and unite against it. You know, that's what you see in wartime. Um, that's what you see, saw in the Cold War, that the United States saw Russia as this great threat and kind of united um, uh, against it. But, but when threats to democracy are internal, I think that, that there is a, an inherent complacency that people have about it. And it's easy to feel complacent or even frustrated with a system which can seem slow and inefficient. Democracy is, on, is of all forms of govern, government, it is um, certainly the most uh, tiresome. Uh, and uh, you need to, you know, build majorities, you need to bridge divisions uh, and to convince people of your ideas. And if you are not successful, they're going to vote you out. And we also sometimes, um, you know, tend to forget that uh, we are so used to democracy that we don't even know what it actually means to, to um, live uh, under an um, authoritarian regime or um, under a dictatorship uh, with no personal rights. And history from Germany and beyond shows us just how quickly democracy can be destroyed and how that destruction can even start with an election. When this bumper electoral year is over, the world will have answers about who will govern and who will be in the room when this decade's big decisions are made. But it's set to open new questions about democracy's resilience and its capacity to self-correct if democratic votes usher in more anti-democratic forces and democracy votes against itself.